We need a we need a point of view. Okay. 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 Next Sunday, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> he has done a lot. <laughs> he has helped me a lot. Alrighty. I think we're ready. Like usual, if y'all got something to say about the text here, don't be afraid to interrupt me. I learn more from you all than I do from reading it myself. I like the inputs, the comments, the questions. I learn from them too. There's a lot of big words in this. I did try to write down how to pronounce them, so if I stumble over them, I apologize, but this guy's a lot smarter than I am. So. All right. December 12th, 2021, the Gospel of Grace for the Jews. The text is from Romans 2, 1 through 29, and the focus is Romans 2, 17 through 29. Key verse is Romans 2, 11, for there is no respect of persons with God that's it. Sorry, I read that a little weird. The application is the student will summarize that salvation is not of works, but solely of grace. <clears throat> Seeking the context. The area in which we live has a substantial population of unhoused people. Nearly every day as I drive around the city, I notice a person asking for help and wondering what life circumstances led them to that point. I'm often tempted to begin thinking less of them or to assign motives that go along with popular stereotypes of the homeless community. Reality uh, about the homeless community of the, yeah, the reality about the unhoused community in comparison with those who have homes is that in God's eyes, they are equally, equally in need of grace. Just because I have a house does not mean I'm, a better person than those without houses. A person's privileged position does not guarantee prosperity. Paul began his epistle to the church in Rome by arguing that the lost world at large stood in de desperate need of the gospel. He wrote that they had suppressed the obvious truth about God and refashioned wor worship into cre creature-centered idolatry, which God frightfully condemns. First, from the first chapter of Romans to the second chapter, though, the focus switches from them to you. It would be easy for religiously devout people to agree with Paul's assessment in chapter 1 about the state of lost humanity, but in the second chapter, Paul would turn his attention from the pagan world to those who expressed convictions about the proper worship of God. Paul would move from t talking about unregenerate sinners to self-righteous, judgmental sinners, Romans 2.1. Paul's job of con convincing the reader of the pagan world's lostness was easy compared to the task of convincing a religious person of his need of grace. Paul could argue that both the ir irreligious and religious alike were in need of grace because of the fact that God does not show partiality. That, that's one of the words I had to write down. 
Whether a person is Jew or Gentile, pagan or religious, he will be judged by God, which is mentioned in verse 16. The person who obeys God through repentance and faith is the one who will be declared righteous. What, whatever his culture, ethnicity, heritage, or privilege, a self-righteous religious hypocrite is just as lost as an adulterous pagan. In today's text, Paul turned his attention to the highly privileged Jewish audience who gleefully boasted in his heritage. Paul revealed that a Jewish person's need for the gospel was just as desperate as a Gentile's need. Before we go into the next paragraph there, I'm going to go ahead and read this question over the side. I really like these questions. They get you thinking. and A lot of the comments we get from everybody, you know, it's, it's a good way to work together. Why is it important to study the deliverance of Israel through the leadership of Moses? Anyone got any thoughts on that? Well, this is it's similar to the way the Lord leads us. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and continue here. Read the next paragraph up. We tend to notice the flaws and shortcomings of other people before we notice them in ourselves. Roman 1, we was probably an easy chapter to study because it focused on people who initially rebel against God. Romans 2 will be more challenging because it will compel us to examine ourselves and recognize our equally desperate need of God's grace. Off to the left, we'll see the passage here. Romans 2, 17 through 24. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thou... Makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more ex excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hast the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest against Teachest, uh, teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhors adult, idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, thou Thou breaking the law dishonorest thy God, thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. He was reading the scripture on the left hand side. He lost us. No, he was, someone was asking where he was at. He was reading the scripture on the left hand side of page 14. That's what he just read. Okay. Yeah, lose all of us. I, I, was, I was wondering. I said the passage there on the left. Oh, I was trying to. I like there, uh, the very last verse of that there in 24. It says, For the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. You know, the person reading this, you know, it's talking to us specifically. It's us. You know, it says through you, we're the reader. You know, I, I like sitting there reading that and you know, like he said there in the opening section there, you know, this is more of a study of us. You know, the first chapter was more of the study of others. This is more of us. So that there's just really turning it towards us instead. It deals a lot with, like you said, hypocrisy. You know, what, how do we look at other people? You know, many times we look at somebody who's homeless or whatever with their little sign and, and we look down on them. We really don't know. I, granted, I, I believe there's a lot of them that are scams, but I believe there's a lot of them that truly need help too. Mm -hmm. And you just don't know the you just don't know the difference mm -hmm. a lot of the times. But you don't know what happened to those people to get to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, but by the grace of God, there go I. You know, we you know, God's been good to us. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things like that. You know, I started. When I was studying through this, I started thinking of other things that, you know, 
we look down on. I mean, you look at enemies around the world to the U.S. I mean, the guy that's in charge of North Korea, I'd say his name. I can't say it. Kim Jong Un. Yeah, him. Uh, you know, people look at him. Oh, he's a dictator. He's a bad guy. God loves him just the same. He needs to be saved just as much as we do. But yet we look down on him because to us, he's a bad guy. We look around the world at what's going on in the world today. You know, a lot of people just wanting to fly the gay pride flag and everything. And we look at that and how they act. And it's like, how can they be like this? And just, I mean, a lot of people just turn up their nose at them when really they just need saved just like we did. I mean, there's no difference there. Yeah, they're living in the sin, but... I mean, there's sin that we live in it every day, too. I mean, tell me one person in here that doesn't sin at least on a daily basis. There's something we all do. They just need saved, too. There's no difference, but yet we turn up our nose at them because sometimes we think we're better than them or we're closer to God than them. There's a lot of things there that we shouldn't be like. A lot of them, too. Well, not gay people, but a lot of people just play naked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they say they are. <laughs> yeah. And when God, <laughs> no atheist in hell, James. That's right. <laughs> Everyone in hell's a believer, huh? That's <laughs> it's too late, but they're believer. Yeah. It's the same way with uh, being gay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, that's a that's a sin. Mm-hmm. Right in the Bible it says marriage shall be between a man and a woman. Right. Yeah. And they're gonna pay for it if they don't. Accept him and change your ways. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Yeah. But they can be saved. Yeah, they can be saved. Everyone they can be saved. They just need to turn from their sin. They want to be somebody. Right. Yeah. Because you're stuck on that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people, I mean, just besides being gay, I mean, there's people that just, that they want to cling to that alcohol more. And they want to cling to that partying life and going out and doing what they want to do on Sundays. I mean, they don't want to change. And a lot of these homeless they do not want to live because they don't want to have to provide by where they want to try to get them to stay and stuff. They don't want to go anywhere because they can't do the liquor and the drugs and they won't, they won't go. That's why a lot of them stay out on the street. And it's sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This was a scam every day. Every day. And they, you see these people overdosing. Then they come and help them. And it's sad, and they go right back and do it again. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of. How many? How many times was, do, do, do people go back to sin? You know, we just we we, we yeah. But I mean, what I'm saying is we can look at somebody who goes back to drugs, but there's a lot of things that we go back to too yeah. that that are sin. All first responders take an oath to be able to help those in need, whether it's the 10th time, the 100th time, and we have what we call frequent flyers. We'll have ones that you're there once or twice a week, putting Narcan in them. Once they come back, oh, hey, how you doing this week? I'm doing the same as I was the other day. And you'll see them the next week, and sometimes you don't see them come back. Grab the body bag. I mean, it's just it's things like that and I mean they don't want the help but God loves them just as much as he loves us and we need to understand that and we don't a lot of times alright we'll go ahead and continue here sorry how you're fine that's what studying's for that's what we're doing we study together searching the text the gospel refutes religious hypocrisy I'm going to try to say that word I mess up on that word every single time I read it After our four children were born and we found ourselves back home from the mission field, we discovered that the state had begun enforcing the seatbelt law. As our children grew, fastening their seatbelt became second nature as soon as they entered the vehicle. But it took me a little longer to form a habit of wearing my seatbelt. I would make sure my kids fastened their seatbelt, but would forget to fasten my own. Now my youngest daughter will make sure I fasten my seatbelt just as I make sure she fastens hers. I must practice what I preach, or else what I preach will not make much difference. While unbelievers store up God's wrath for themselves when they refuse to acknowledge Him, religious people are just as susceptible 
to judgment when they <laughs> hold others to standards they themselves are unwilling to meet. Paul spent several verses arguing that many religious Jews who have been privileged to know of God were unwilling to practice what they preached. Hypocrisy begins when a person's when a person assumes a position of authority or privilege. The thank you. The Jews Paul addressed are uh, enjoyed the privileged position of having received a heritage of faith and first-hand knowledge of Jehovah. As origin as original recipients of God's law, they boasted in their understanding of his word. This position did indeed place Jews in position of authority, as they were God's chosen people through whom God brought his Son into the world. Knowledge and authority without rep repentance, though, leads to pride. Unchecked pride stemmed from positions of authority and privilege will then reveal corruption at some point. Paul challenged the Jews who used their privilege to disobey the very law they claimed to uphold. In making the claim they, that those who boast in the law actually dishonor God by breaking the law, Paul led the reader to understand that everyone is in need of God's grace because everyone is a lawbreaker. People who claim to represent God perfectly but are exposed as lawbreakers themselves damage their testimony through their hypocritical misrepresentation of God. Paul quoted Isaiah's lament that God's name is despised, despised thank you, among the lost because of the hypocrisy of those Jews who claim to represent him in Isaiah 52.5. The problem with people like the Jewish readers who were in position of privilege and authority were not in their elevated knowledge concerning the ways of God. Their problem lay in their boasting of their privilege and claim of spiritual superiority. Yeah, that. Superiority. Yeah, superiority. Yeah, that word. I know what it means. Can't say it. <clears throat> Advancement in education and understanding of God and His Word is an ex ex expected, thank you, pursuit among all of God's children. We run into dangers through when our intellect turns into pride, boasting, and we forget our need of God's grace. Legalism among the people of God gives gives cause for unbelievers to dismiss their testimony, which can defeat their attempt to obey the Great Commission. We must never forget how the great, graceful gospel, gospel of Jesus Christ rescues us from our religious hypocrisy. When we are tempted to judge others according to the standards which we are unwilling to keep ourselves, we must embrace the grace of Christ who rescues religious and irreligious alike. God shows grace to those spiritually far and near since we are desperately we all desperately need salvation. What areas of hypocrisy do you see in your own life and how will you address it with the gospel? I'm not saying you have to call out your own, but what would be most common? Judging others. You what? Judging others. We judge others a lot. Mm -hmm. As Christians, we should be telling others to pray and read God's word, but do we do it? Mm -hmm. you know, we need to study his word. We need to pray to God and... When we're we, telling others to do that, we need to be doing that. We need to practice what we preach, just like he said. And practice what we preach. Especially around kids. Because kids watch you. Kids watch you. A lot of people watch you, not just kids. Well, I know, but... I'm just saying. I do. I do. Oh, yeah. Especially when you claim you're a Christian. <clears throat> Just telling people you're a Christian is going to put eyes on you. Mm -hmm. They're going to be watching what you do. Yeah. I was at work the other day, and there's a pastor friend of mine there, and really good guy. And he was talking to a group of guys there, and they thought he said a cuss word. He didn't, but they thought he did. So ever since then, it's, oh, he said a cuss word. 
they're teasing him. He didn't, and everyone knows it, but they tease him about it. And now if anybody heard us say that, they're going to not know it's a joke. Or not us, I don't say it, but they're not going to know it's a joke, and they're going to assume the preacher's over here cussing. So, I mean, we got to watch what we say and how we say stuff, even if it's not close to us. Don't use those words. Close to. Oh. Not supposed to pinch it. Alright. While she's crying, we're going to go ahead on the next page on the left side of the page. Okay. Left side. Romans 2, 25 through 29. We'll go ahead and read it. What? Oh. Uh, should be hungry. Who knows? We'll go ahead and continue. For circumcision verily profit if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. We're good now. She'll be happy. She's a Jarvis. When she's hungry, she's hungry. She's only a little <laughs> We get grouchy when we're hungry. It's not her fault. I blame Dad. <clears throat> All right. The gospel. I'll say in this passage of scripture, the Jews were just depending on the fact that they were Jews. Well, I'm a Jew. That's that's all matters. Not whether or not they truly been saved. You know, like, well, we're Jewish. You know, <laughs> well, you still need to be saved. You know, it's not what he's saying. It's what's on the heart in the heart, whether you're Jew or a Gentile. You know, but, so that, that's what he was getting at here. All right. The gospel renews repentance. Repent hearts. The first time I received a flu vaccine, I was so proud of myself for wisely preparing for the flu season. I had the mistaken notice that I would be immune to the virus and did not need to follow safe practices to keep from catching it. I learned the hard way that the inoculation, inoculation I had to look this word up, but I can't remember how to say it, did not prevent me from catching the flu. Much to my surprise, I caught the flu anyways and ended up in bed for a few days. The personal pride I held in receiving the vaccine quickly disappeared in debilitating. debilitating illness. Many religious Jews during the time of Paul mistakenly thought that if they received circumcision according to the law of Moses, they would not receive judgment from God. Circumcision was the outward act of testifying that testified to inward trust and dependence on God who gave the law. The act of circumcision only demonstrated what should have taken place in the heart, but many thought the outward demonstration of obedience was the most important right to be followed. This unfortunately mis unfortunate misunderstanding led many to pridefulness. People assumed that they were righteous because of works performed tend to have higher views of themselves in comparison to others. Paul reminded the readers that God did indeed establish the right of circumcision and required it for all Jewish males who would partake in his covenant in Genesis 17, 9-14. Circumcision was beneficial, but for those who went on to violate the law, God continued counted them as though they were uncircumcised and liable to his judgments. What would happen, in contrast, if any uncircumcised person kept the law of God in righteousness? Paul wrote that if any uncircumcised person kept God's law, God would not bring him into judgment, 
but count him as having been circumcised. Paul drew out the importance of inward righteousness before God in contrast to simple contrast to simple outward religious behavior. In this case, Paul wrote that it would be entirely possible for an outwardly religious Jewish man to be judged by an uncir- to be judged by an uncircumcised Gentile if his heart had been transformed in righteousness. The difference lies in each person's inward condition as opposed to his outward showing of religious behavior. Someone who is truly a child of God, according to Paul, will have a heart committed to God in repentance and faith whether or not he is circumcised. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only way someone can have his heart softened in repentance. Like Paul's reader began to understand, mere outward religious behavior cannot deliver anyone from the condemnation of sin. But modifications alone that adapt to man-made expectations may lead someone to receive the accolades of men. But God will not be impressed if the changes do not stem from inward transformation of the hearts. Yes, if I can, you and I can be tempted to congratulate. congratulate ourselves with our Christian behavior. We may conform to the expected norms of Christianity through church attendance, tithing, or doing other good deeds. We often do good deeds out of pride for the praise of man instead of obeying the glory of God. If this is the case, we, what we need is a reminder that our sinners, that we are sinners who have been rescued by the grace of God through His Son Jesus Christ. We should remind ourselves of the gospel message that transformed our hearts in regeneration. Mm-hmm. But the Holy Spirit, instead of being elevated in pride, repentance alone. Uh, repentance allows God to change our hearts, making it possible for us to obey God and bring Him glory. How does the gospel lead us to repentance? What's the gospel? Tells you how to get saved. What? The uh, gospel. Yeah, what did Bart say? Just talking to the kid. Oh. Shows us we're lost. Shows us. Salvation is for whosoever. Shows you you're a sinner. Shows you you're a sinner and that it's for everybody, not just one. Doesn't matter what you are, who you are, or what color you are. It's anybody. Mm-hmm. Shows you what you need to be spiritually and physically to be closer to God. All right, setting the application. Most parents establish rules for their children early in their lives. In fact, many children learn how to say no before they learn how to say yes, probably because they hear no more often. While it's very important for children to learn the difference between right and wrong from their parents, it is more important that children learn about Jesus and their need for salvation. Children raised in homes without learning the saving grace of the gospel never know anything other than rules keeping or rule breaking. Christian parents realize their children might keep the rules from time to time, but until the child is born again, their repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, their outward obedience is simply behavior modification. The most important event in every person's life is when they hear the gospel, repent and believe in Jesus Christ. It is only then that a person can have the desire and ability to honor God with their behavior. A person who is only who only knows religious activity without acknowledging his need for grace and repentance will become hypocritical. Similarly, yeah, that's okay. A Christian who receives the blessing of a gospel of the gospel of Christ only to become a puffed up in pride may cause more harm to the cause of Christ than help. We live to testify. We live to testify to the world of God's grace through His Son. But if others know us only by our attempt, ad, attempted adherence to rules instead of our des, des, desperate need for God's grace, we may lead them astray. Jesus told his church, the world would know them by their love for one another in John thirteen thirty five. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for everyone, especially those for those 
steeped in man-made religion who are willing to acknowledge their need for God's grace. How can you take better advantage of the blessings God has given you? Tell people about Jesus. I thought the best way to take advantage of it was by not giving ourselves the credit, but by giving it to God. You know, a lot of times we see something that we've done in our lives, you know, whether it be get the job we've been working for, or finishing up college or school or whatever, and actually getting a decent grade, you know, or having a child, you know, we give ourselves the credit and say, oh man, that was so good. We've done a good job. It's not us that done it. Praise God through it. Praise God through it. He's the one that got us through it. Any other comments or questions or concerns? Concerns? All right. If not, we'll go ahead and dismiss. We got about a minute or two.